Well, we're uh, in a little mini-series, you might call it, talking about sharing our faith and uh, ways to share our faith. And last week we, we talked about divine appointments and what makes a, what makes a divine appointment? Anybody remember from last week? How many were here last week? Well, what makes a divine appointment is when you bring the divine in, into the moment, into the appointment. When you, when you share Jesus or when you share a scripture or when you ask to pray for someone or somehow you, you enter into a conversation uh, dealing with the Lord. And so uh, I believe there are divine appointments available for us probably on a daily basis for most of us. We're running into people. We're seeing people. Uh, those are opportunities to, you know, somehow sow something of worth into another person's life. And sometimes it might be just a good deed. And sometimes it might be just something you do for someone in the name of the Lord, you know, and just bringing a neighbor some cookies. Or there, there's a number of ways, shoveling somebody's driveway in the winter. There's so many ways that we can just reach out and, and be a witness to somebody. But we can make these divine appointments happen. We don't have to... We don't have to wait for them. They're, they're there. I was thinking about it in my own life, and, and, you know, when I worked in law enforcement, I told you before that I always thought that if I was going to transport a prisoner, um, that was going to be a divine appointment. If I had to take somebody, if they asked me, Randy, will you take this person to St. Cloud, or will you take them to Stillwater or somewhere? And if they asked me to do it, I just felt like, Lord, you set this up. This, was, this is time for a divine appointment. I'm going to share Jesus with this person that I'm going to transport. And it, it's, it almost like never failed. Every time that happened, I got an opportunity to talk about the Lord with that person. And I didn't have to push it. I didn't have to force it, even though they were prisoners. Um, you know, it just it became something that we talked about. And I thought the reason why they don't happen as much now, of course, I'm not doing that. But I think, like you, we're not asking or we're not, we're not thinking divine appointments today. We're not thinking, who am I going to see? You know, God, today, because I'm on the planet, you have divine appointments for me. It doesn't matter where I work or what I do. Because I'm on the planet, you can use me. You can use my mouth to, to say something to somebody. And so we, need, we have to be more intentional. I, I felt like that's what the Lord was, you know, showing me. I have to be more intentional about... Uh, he, him wanting me to, to keep sharing and to keep talking to people. They don't have to be sitting in the back seat of a squad car. Some people are already sitting in the back seat of a squad car and they don't even know it. Amen. They're already prisoners in their own mind and they're already all messed up and, and need help. They need deliverance. And God sends us to them. And so we're going to talk a little bit more today about, about, you know, divine appointments, but more focusing on why we don't share. Why don't you share your faith? Why don't you talk to people about Jesus? And um, I think it has to do with fear, fear of man. And so we're going to talk a little bit about fear and boldness today. But I just want to back up for just one second on, on what we talked about last week. Uh, I, I said I would say a little bit more about Ephesians 3.10. And Ephesians 3.10, it's, it's Paul is talking about this, this mystery in Ephesians, this mystery of the gospel. The mystery is that Jesus is for everybody. That Jesus is for the Jews, the Greeks, and everybody, and, and that God has purposed this and planned it from the beginning, and he wants to unleash it. He wants to use us. He wants to use all people. And, and Paul is encouraging people to, uh, to speak up about Jesus. And in verse uh, 10 of chapter 3, he says, To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church through the principalities and powers in heavenly places. We talked about that a little bit last week. We talked about the manifold wisdom of God. And, that, you know, you read about wisdom in Proverbs, and it's, it's, it's the wisdom of God. It's Jesus, really. It's knowing Jesus is where wisdom comes from, ultimately. And, and uh, we talked about how the manifold, you know, man, that man, word manifold means many layers, like an accordion. Um, you, you know, like these shades on the window you, you you push them up and there's so many layers and you pull them down and they cover a, a large area and it's just like it's there's such such depth in jesus there's so much that we can learn and, and so many ways we can grow and so what 
when it's talking about the man to the intent that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known, this word known is uh, is an interesting word. It's a Greek word gnosko, and it means it means to know for sure. It means to know intimately. It means to know by experience. So we need to know Jesus intimately. We need to know him by experience. We need to know him really well. <laughs> we, yeah, how many know I could, I could sit here and tell you about things that I know? Okay, I've, I've been a scuba diver. Uh, I, was, I did a lot of scuba diving over the years, and, and mainly in law enforcement. I was a rescue diver. And so I could sit here and tell you all about rescue diving. I could tell you all about scuba diving. I could give you all the information on scuba, scuba diving and what you need and they talk about the equipment and, and all the equipment that's necessary and how much weight you need to put on your belt and all the stuff that I know about scuba diving and, until you're bored with it. I could tell you all that I know about it. Would you really know scuba diving at that point? You don't know scuba diving until you go in the water and scuba dive, amen, until you go down under the water, until you get in there and you experience it for yourself. And that's what he's talking about in this verse, that, that this manifold wisdom of God might be fully known. Right? That it's, If it's going to be known out there and in the heavenly realm, even to the principalities and powers, it has to be known by us. We have to release that kind of knowing and that kind of faith into the atmosphere and, and into to the powers and principalities and to people around us. And so what we really need is we need to know him. Amen? We need to experience him at a deeper level. And you can talk about church. You can, you can, you know, you can know all the stuff about church. But if you don't know Jesus, you miss it. Amen? You miss it, and there's so many people that they know about church, they know about Jesus, they say they, you know, they believe in the Bible and stuff, but do they really know Him? Have they know? Do they know Him as Lord and Savior, Master, the one who you've given your life to? And that's that's what we're after, and that's what Paul was after here. That 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 wisdom, that manifold wisdom of God, might be known. We need to make it known, Amen. So we have to know Him. We have to know them really well if we're going to make it known. You can't talk about something and convince others if you don't know yourself. But the cool thing is about, about sharing the, your faith and the gospel is you don't have to know it all. Amen? You don't have to be this deep, deep Christian and have studied and gone to Bible school and just to share your faith. What, God, what Jesus did for you. What did he do in your life? What did he do in your heart? You can share that. Amen. There's stories in the scriptures where people went and said what he did. And they witnessed right away the woman at the well. She went and told everybody about this man she met. And he told me everything and, and changed my life. And she was a witness right away. And so you don't have to, you know, get this degree and, and have all kinds of knowledge just to go share Jesus with people. But we need to know him. We, have, we need to be in relationship with him. Amen. Amen. So today we're going to talk about probably the number one thing that stops us from sharing, and I believe it's the fear of man. Amen. So hey, I want to just talk a little bit about fear in the, in the time that we have left, and um, there's some scriptures I want to share with you. Um, Proverbs 29, I mentioned it already, 25, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Proverbs 28, one says, the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Joshua 1.9, if you read Joshua, it's just like on and on and on about fear. Fear not. Uh, he says, I have, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. How many know he's with us wherever we go? Isaiah 41.10, one of my favorite verses, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So God is going to strengthen us. God is going to help us. Uh, how many know that fear will just stop you? Fear will stop you in your tracks. The fear of man is really a crippling thing, and it keeps people from speaking up. It keeps us from stepping out into the plan that God has for us. It keeps us from divine appointments. 
Fear goes way back to the garden. What did Adam and, and Eve do after they sinned? They hid. They hid from God. They were afraid. They, were actually, they became afraid of God. And, uh, and so fear goes way back. And the devil has specialized in making people afraid ever since. What are his two specialties? Fear and shame. Amen? If he can't get you with fear, he'll get you, with, he'll get you to be quiet because of shame. Because you, you're, you feel guilty about your own mess and about your own sin and what you've done. And so uh, shame sets in and you won't talk to people because you're ashamed of your own life. And you're silenced because of your own dumb decisions. And, and uh, somehow another, another way that fear gets us is we don't want to look like one of those weird Christians. You know, we don't want to look like one of those fanatical, uh, crazy people. They, re- they look really strange to the world. Amen? <laughs> you might look really strange to the world. And, and, you know, it's like we don't want to be associated with one of those. We don't want people to think that we're weird like that. I think it's okay to be weird. They think you're weird anyway. So you might as well just go with it and not worry about what people think. You know, we have to really get over what people think. It's really, it's kind of pride in a way. Isn't it Pride. It's like, you don't want people, you don't want, it's like sometimes teenagers don't want to be embarrassed by their parents. Or I remember when I used to bring my girls to school in a junky old car, and they'd say, can you drop me off like, you know, a couple blocks before we actually get up to the school? Because they didn't want to be seen, you know, seen climbing out of this rusty junker. And, uh. You know, it's just like we don't want to be seen or we don't want to be known among certain people. I used to have a guy that would stop up into the sheriff's office when I worked there, and, and he was pretty well known, and he was pretty loud. And he'd come in, and he'd say, praise the Lord, hallelujah, Jesus is on the throne, you know, it just t- to anybody, whoever was there. And then, you know, I'd invite him in, and, and he'd be like, he'd be just talking about Jesus all the time. Or if somebody was cussing, he would get right on them. And say, hey, don't be using my God's, my, my God's name like that, you know? you know. Don't be using his name like that, please. And I mean, he, he just, he was very bold. And I was almost embarrassed sometimes, you know, that he was coming to see me. And uh, it was bad enough I was already called preacher man by some of the, a couple of the deputies. And then this guy would come in and just kind of put fuel on the fire. And after a while, I just thought, you know what? I really like when he comes in. He stirs this place up a little bit. He brings in a little edge here, and I think people need to hear it. Amen? Sometimes sometimes they, there needs to be a, somebody that's got a little edge to them and not afraid, not afraid what people think. And so I think I want to just encourage you, because sometimes you're going to be a stench to some people. The Scripture says you will be. But to others, you'll be a, an aroma, a sweet aroma, the sweet aroma of Christ. And they'll, they'll pick up on it, and they'll sense something. Amen? They'll sense, they'll sense something's different about you, and, and people will want to be around you. Some people don't, they won't want to be around you. I don't like it when people don't like me. How about you? <laughs> we want to be liked, right? I don't like it when people don't like me. I want to be liked. But honestly, I've gotten to the point where it doesn't really matter if you like me or not. You know, it's just like I'm not going to, I'm not going to lose sleep over it because God likes me. He loves me, and that's what's really important, and I don't have to be liked by everybody. It's okay if they don't like me, and some of them won't like us, amen? Because, you know, even if you love people with just the love of Jesus and you're so wonderful and beautiful to them, they just won't like you. They'll reject you because of Jesus. The powers and principalities that we've been talking about, they're influencing people. And it's not the people that we're fighting. It's the demonic strongholds and, and the dark forces that we can't see. That's who we're really fighting. Well, let's look at a scripture. Let's, we're just going to look at a couple scriptures here. Um, Philippians 1. Philippians 1. 12 to, we'll probably read through uh, 20, but let's look at, at verse 12 to 14 first it says 
But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually, ha have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. So Paul's in prison, and he says, hey, don't worry about it. This thing is turning out okay, because everybody knows now that my chains are in Christ. That's, you know, nobody can chain me, but I'm here because of Jesus. And he says, most of the brethren in the Lord have become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So the, so the brothers became more confident because of Paul's change. They, they, they got this new boldness to speak the word of the Lord without fear. Some indeed pre preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill in verse 15. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my change, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. And so Paul is like, he's just like, it's all about the gospel. It doesn't matter. Sometimes people preach it out of pretense and, and they're selfish and it, it doesn't really matter as long as, as long as the gospel is preached. Amen. He says in verse 20 that his earnest expectation is, and hope is that in nothing will he be ashamed, but with boldness, Christ will be magnified in his body, whether in life or in death. He says, for, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And so it, it doesn't really matter to Paul. He said, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For, to me, live, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He said, he goes on in, in 20, 23, he says, for I am... Uh, in 22, he says, but if I live on in the, in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell, for I'm hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being con confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me be, may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. And so he's like, he's like, if I live or I die, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. I, but I, I, wanna, I wanna stay here. It's, it's useful for me to be here for you. But to die is gain. And so Paul just didn't care about his life even, amen? He said, he said it doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. And so when we're talking about you know, fear, we're talking about being afraid, I think we have to get to that place where we don't care. Jesus is the most important thing. Jesus is the most important thing, and Jesus is what people need. And it's like we have what they need. Amen? We have what they need. If you, have, if you know somebody has cancer and you have the cure, you want to share with them the cure. Amen? And so we have what people need. And, and, and like Dan said, it, it, we, can, we can witness in so many different ways. Uh, I think Dan is really good at apologetics. He's really good at talking about worldview, and he's studied that stuff, and, and he can put all that together. He's really good at talking about um, historical things, and he can put dates on things that I can't remember, you know, for five minutes. And, I, you know, it, it's just not fair that people can remember stuff like that. And, uh, but he can do that, and that's the way God's wired him. That's the way God's gifted him. You might be totally different, amen? You can talk about other things and how he's wired you and, and what he's done in your life. And, and I think the, the problem is, is that some people think that they can't talk to people or they can't share with people or God, God didn't gift them that way or they're too quiet or they're, you know, they're just, it's somebody else's, I'll be the person that prays or I'll be the person that bakes bread or I just don't want to talk to people. I think God has given us all a voice, amen? And some of these quiet people that won't talk to anybody, you get them on their subject, you get them on something that they like, and they will talk your ear off. And so they prove that they can talk about Jesus. They, they prove that they can talk about things, amen? So we just have to kind of get to the place where uh, we don't let the fear of man stop us. 
it'll really cripple us. And I've talked to you before about even some of my own fears of people. And, I mean, I used to just sweat bullets when I had to get up in front of people. And especially if I had to sing in front of people. Because I think I told you when I was younger, my brother used to always tell me I was so off. And he would elbow me and say, you know, get on key. Can't you hear that? He was a music person. He's a piano player. And he was, you know, really gifted in music. And I wasn't. And so we'd be singing in the choir. And he'd always be elbowing me and telling me, you can't sing. You're off. You know, get it right. What's wrong with you? Can't you hear that? And it was like, <laughs> that's what I believed. You know, and so then I become a worship leader. And I'm just like, this is the most fearful thing ever because I know I can't sing. And I've been told that, you know, growing up. And, and I kind of, somehow I believed it. Even though I loved to sing and I was a worshiper, you know, I wasn't a great singer. I knew I wasn't a great singer and I'm still not a great singer, but I love to worship. But I got to the point where it's, I don't care. It's going to sound good to God when it gets through the ceiling. Amen. I, I don't want to offend anybody here, but, you know, it's just like we get so freaked out about stuff. It carried over into my preaching, too, that, you know, I was always, you know, I, I went through a long stretch where I thought, you know, they're not liking me or they're, they're doing something or they're ignoring me or they're looking down and you pick up on all these signs and it, it freaks you out a little bit. Amen. Now you can go to sleep and I don't care. I'll, I'll just send one of the ushers to slap you, but, you know. Be ready. Somebody might pounce on you if you fall asleep. But we have to get over some of that stuff. We just have to get over some of that stuff. And I remember one time being in my boss's office, and he said, when I was in the sheriff's department, he said, you know, I just have to tell you, Randy. He said, he said, you know, I've had some complaints that you've been talking to people about Jesus when you're working. And he said, i got to tell you. And he began to cry. He couldn't finish his sentence. And he turned around and walked away. And it's like, because before that, I told him, I was warned before that, and I said, hey, if somebody is telling me that they're going to commit suicide or they're going to, you know, they've got this horrible stuff going on in their life and they just can't stand another day and they don't know what to do and they don't know where to turn, if I have to tell them that they should go see a shrink, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to tell them they should go see Jesus. you got to get to know Jesus Christ, the Savior, and he'll set you free. And that's exactly what I told them. I said, I, said, I, won't, be, I won't be stopped in that way. I'm going to keep telling people, and, I, and, I, and I'll get another job if that's what I have to do. But I won't be silenced about Jesus. And so, so then the next time he talked to me is when he, he just got all choked up. And he realized that it's true. Amen. It's true. Next week, we're going to go to Acts 4 and look at, look at uh, Peter and John. And you remember the trouble that they got in because they healed a guy who had been crippled for 45 years. And the whole town knew about it. Everybody knew about it. The same people that put Jesus to death were now dealing with Peter and John and warning them, hey, don't be preaching about this Jesus anymore. Don't be talking about this. And what did they do? They kept preaching more. In fact, they went back with their friends and they, they prayed for boldness, more boldness. They were already bold. They already answered the questions like, Jesus of Nazareth healed this guy. And there's only salvation in his name. No other name. That was their answer. We're going to look at that next week and, and continue our, talking about boldness and uh, hear from another person's, their, their testimony there, the way they came to know Jesus. So let's pray. Father, thank you for boldness today. Thank you for boldness today. Why don't you stand with me? Here's what happened in that story in Acts 4, if you want to read up on it. When they're praying for boldness, they, they're, they remind God of who he is and what he said. And they remind God about what he said about Jesus. They remind God of, that he's sovereign. He's the king of the universe. And they said, sovereign God, we ask for boldness. Will you give us boldness to preach Jesus? Boldness to preach Jesus. That's what they were after. They asked for boldness to, cheat, to preach Jesus. And you know what happened? The place that they were in began to shake. 
the building began to move. And the Bible says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they were filled to preach boldly about Jesus. That's why they were filled with the Spirit, to preach boldly about Jesus. So, you know, if you want, why don't we just ask God to fill us right now in that same way, to fill us with boldness, fill us with His Spirit, so that we might be witnesses, and that, that we would overcome fear, and we'd overcome the fear of man, and that we'd step out of that fear realm and into a faith realm, where we're just going to speak boldly the word that God gives us. We're going to be bold about praying for people. We're going to be bold about asking them if they know the Savior. Father, would you just do a work in our heart? We, we recognize that you are the sovereign God that you're the king of the universe, that you took a little, a little Catholic boy and, and laid him out on the playground, God, and cared about him so much that you, you dealt intimately with him way back then, Lord, and then you've tracked him through his life, Lord, and even to the woman that he was going to marry, God. And we just thank you for those kinds of stories, how you've been so involved in people's lives. And, Lord, we thank you for the path that we've all taken to get where we are today with you, Lord, and, and how your manifold wisdom just keeps being unveiled, Lord, and we keep learning more about you, and it's more excited. The more, the more we learn, the more exciting it is. And we just want to say we love you today, and we call on your mighty name right now, and we just say fill us with your spirit. Fill us to overflowing. Fill us, God, till we talk about you. Lord, we, we come against fear. We come against the fear of man. We come against that spirit of rejection that people carry. We come against that, that spirit, Lord, of, of uh, just um, being afraid, Lord, of no confidence, of those curses that were spoke over us that we believed. We break them off in Jesus' name. And we just thank you for freedom. We just break off the spirit of fear, irrational fear about anything, if anybody's dealing with that, Lord, we just break that off in Jesus' name. Lord, Lord, you said that the righteous are as bold as lions. And we're righteous because of Jesus today, and we are as bold as lions. We're as gentle as doves. We're wise as serpents, Lord, and we're bold as lions. And that's our, that's our statement today, God. That's who we are because that's who you say we are. And we thank you for it. Lord, make us bold, we pray. Make your church bold, I pray. Lord, we want to talk about Jesus to our neighbors, to friends, to people that we meet, to people on the streets, or to that Oikos group that we've talked about, those people in our lives that we know a little bit about, Lord. Help us open a door, I pray, Lord, that we would look for doors. We, we would be looking for doors. We'd be looking for those divine appointments, those opportunities to speak up and say something about Jesus. Lord, that we wouldn't, uh, wouldn't offend people by being rude or ignorant, but we'd be winsome. We'd be loving, and we would not be afraid to speak the word, to speak truth. And we thank you for it. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that there'd be a shaking in this place, a shaking in our hearts. Oh, God, that the fear of the Lord would come back into our lives and come back into the church, Lord. That we would fear you in a deeper way, Lord, recognizing that you're God Almighty, you're King of the universe, and we would walk humbly with our God. And, Father, we thank you. We love you this morning. Thank you for the testimonies and the testimonies to come. Thank you for this time of year. We look forward to uh, Christmas, the birth of our King. Lord, we love you. Thank you for divine appointments this week. This week, Lord, help us to wake up tomorrow morning, even this afternoon, with our eyes open, looking for those appointments. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's go out with a song this morning.